So this talk is what you need to get through in order to get to lunch, so thank you for being here. So as Seb said, my name is Jodie Birchall. I work at JetBrains, as you can see. This is not a sponsored talk, but I just want to acknowledge they did pay me for my time to prepare this talk and also my travel here, so just a quick thank you to them. So today I'm going to be giving you a talk about a very hot topic at the moment, which is hallucinations in large language models. And as you can imagine, if you have read anything about this, this is a huge and extremely complex topic. I have half an hour, so I'm going to be able to give you the 10,000 foot view. But what I'm hoping you're going to leave here with today is an idea of why hallucinations happen in LLMs, how we can classify them and measure them, and some things that people are doing to try to mitigate them. So anyone who's used an autoregressive large language model, that is a large language model that can generate text, would have seen the ability of these models to come up with coherent, sometimes useful text on a wide variety of topics and in a wide range of styles. So for example, I prompted ChatGPT4 to give me a Shakespearean sonnet about the night sky. And this is what it came up with. Upon the velvet cloak of night's embrace, the stars, like jewels, in the heavens dance their light, a silent song that spans the space, a tapestry of fate and sweet romance, like something the bard himself could have written. But autoregressive LLMs are also well known for when their content misses the mark. So take this example of when someone asked ChatGPT 3.5, how do I cross, or no, what is the world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on foot? And at the time, ChatGPT returned the following. The world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on foot is held by Christoph Fundrasch of Germany, who completed the crossing in 14 hours and 51 minutes on August 4th, 2020. <laughs> of course, this is complete nonsense. And those dates and those times are made up out of thin air. So this tendency of LLMs to generate incorrect outputs is, of course, called hallucinations. And these pose a major problem for the application of LLMs to real-world applications. So to understand why autoregressive LLMs can produce both coherent, helpful text and also these insane hallucinations, we first need to understand the ingredients that go into these models. So the first was the development of a type of neural net architecture called, of course, the transformer architecture. I think it needs no introduction at this point in time. So transformer architectures were originally developed in 2017 in order to do machine translation, but they were quickly adapted to other natural language tasks. And one of the main reasons that transformer models have become so powerful, so popular, is that they're much more successful than previous models at working with a lot of data. They tend to scale very well compared to previous models like long short term memory networks or LSTMs. And they're not only able to process much larger amounts of text, a bigger context window, but they can also efficiently train on much larger data sets. And this, of course, leads to the second ingredient in the success of autoregressive LLMs. So when we talk about these models, we're generally talking about models that are based on a specific part of the transformer architecture, the decoder. If you want the difference between the different types of transformer models explained, Hugging Face has this incredible NLP course that approaches this really from first principles. Even if you have no background in the area, you just know some Python, and you know a little bit about neural nets, you can go through that course pretty easily, so I do recommend it. So decoder-based models are trained using millions or most likely billions of example sentences, and they're asked for each sentence to predict the next word in the sequence. And what's really cool about this is it means that the training data scales very easily because you don't really need to do any manual labeling as you would with what's called a fully supervised type of learning. All you need to do is split a sentence at a point and you use the first part of that sentence as the input and you use the next word in that sentence as a target. So now we have two ingredients, that beautiful scalable transformer architecture and a whole load of training data. And researchers have been able to combine these to make bigger and more powerful autoregressive LLMs. So let's have a look at the case of the GPT family. I do want to emphasize, we're at an open source conference, the GPT family is not the only one worth talking about. 
But GPT-1 was the OG model in this area, so it gives us a nice illustration of how these models have evolved. So GPT-1 was 120 million parameters, which seems very quaint at this point in time. The second one was 13 times that size at 1.5 billion parameters, and the models have just kept growing and growing. GPT-4 is estimated to be at 1 trillion parameters. And as they've grown, they've gotten better and better at doing a range of natural language tasks. So we can get a sense of how LLM performance has improved over the generations by looking at how each of them respond to the exact same prompt. Complete the following sentence, Belgium is. I do promise I'm not taking pot shots at Belgium. I do love Belgium, but uh, you'll see. So GPT-1 is very good at producing sentences that are grammatically correct, but there's no real sense of what the context of the words are. So this is the attempt of GPT-1 in response to our prompt. <laughs> the best you can say about it is that it's grammatically correct. So GPT-2 is a bit more sophisticated, but again, it's really just doing grammar prediction. So this is GPT-2's attempt. Yeah. Now, GPT-3 was where the model started learning not only grammar, but also started encoding some information about the training data that it was seeing. So for our prompt, GPT-3 outputs this nice little sentence. It's on topic, and it makes sense. And then GPT-3.5 output a whole bloody essay. So why is it that we're seeing much more sensical outputs from GPT-3 onwards? Well, under the hood, these models are essentially doing what Andre Kaparthi calls a lossy compression of their training data. And as anyone who's worked with lossy compression algorithms knows, the less that you have to compress the data, the more you can conserve. So the smaller models, GPT-1 and 2, they had to compress their training data so much that they could only really encode the most commonly seen information, grammar rules like parts of speech or the word order. But as the models got larger, they could conserve more and more information. And by the time we hit GPT-3 and models around this size, they have enough parameters to encode knowledge that they're exposed to frequently enough, something that's become known as the parametric knowledge of large language models. And this, of course, leads us to the data that these models are learning from. So most of these huge text data sets, and these are truly huge text data sets, they're sourced, of course, from the web. And the most important of these for training autoregressive LLMs to date has been Common Crawl. Now, Common Crawl is a project that was started many years ago, and it was originally designed to mimic Google's crawler, basically finding the most commonly linked pages on the internet to provide a huge open source data set for research into natural language processing and information retrieval. So because it's a research data set, it's provided unfiltered. And what this means that um, if you're an LLM uh, creator and you want to use it to train your model, you need to apply some sort of filtering to it. And because it's so big, you can't do this manually. So this filtering is done through a combination of text classifiers or rules. And you know, obviously, these are probabilistic approaches. So earlier filterings of common crawl focused on doing things like removing low quality duplicate or offensive content. So GPT-3, for example, 80% of its training data came from such a filtering of common crawl. There's a similar filtering called C4. This was used to train Google's T5 and the original Llama model from Meta. However, there's this fascinating paper, I've actually linked it at the bottom. I'm providing all my links at the end, so don't feel that you need to take photos. Basically, the Washington Post did this really interesting investigation of C4, and they found that it contained a lot of pretty messy stuff, offensive, racist, um, pornographic content, and quite a lot of the content came from dubious sources. So 4% of the content of C4 came from personal blogs, and I'm sure you've seen the sort of quality of stuff that's in those. So more modern sources for training these models have tried to correct for this. So last year, a much more aggressively filtered version of Common Core Crawl was created called Refined Web, and this was used to train the powerful Falcon models. And data sets such as the Pile try to focus on higher quality data sets. They only use Common Crawl for around 18% of the text source, and they focus more on sources like PubMed, Gutenberg, and Wikipedia. 
But of course, this earlier reliance on inadequately filtered versions of common crawl has left its mark. And many of the foundational models that we're still relying on have been trained on these inadequately filtered sources. So just an aside before I go on, one final thing we need to think about is when we think about models hallucinating is we need to understand the difference between base LLMs and their application. So, so far when we've been talking about LLMs, we've just been talking about these models that were simply trained to complete words in a sentence. But these models by themselves are not that useful, and they usually have some sort of changes or augmentations made to them to make them much more useful. And these changes can influence the hallucination rates for better or for worse. So I do not have time to go into it uh, right now. I'll be happy to talk about it after the talk. But this can include things like instruction tuning, reinforcement learning from human feedback, temperature, and of course, the difference between a model and a model in a larger app, like GPT versus chat GPT. OK, so now we know how LLMs are trained and applied. We can now talk about the two types of hallucinations that these models can have. The first are faithfulness hallucinations. This is when autoregressive LLMs attempt to do some sort of natural language task over a piece of text, such as summarization or question answering. And when they do that, they deviate from the text somehow. So for example, let's say we want our LLM to summarize this piece of text about the moon landing. The text clearly states that the landing happened on July 20th, but the walk happened on July 21st. But if the model incorrectly summarizes and says that the walk happened on July 21st, this would be a faithfulness hallucination. The second type of hallucination are factuality hallucinations. And this is, of course, when the model has learned something incorrect from the training data. Now, it might have been something that was correct at the time that the model was trained, like who the president is, and it's now out of date knowledge. But sometimes it's straight up wrong from the outset. So, for example, if we ask our model who the first person was to walk on the moon, and it says Charles Lindbergh, this would be a, fa a factuality hallucination. And this is the type of hallucination I'm going to focus on most during this talk. So let's have a look at how we might measure these two types of hallucinations. There are many, many, many different ways of doing this, so I'm just going to touch on it. So for faithfulness hallucinations, you're generally just trying to see how accurately the model can perform a range of natural language tasks. So for example, we have the squad version 2 data set, which assesses how well models can do question answering. And there's another data set, the Extreme Summarization, or Exum data set, which attempts to see how well models can do one-sentence summarizations of longer news articles. And factuality hallucinations, on the other hand, are unsurprisingly assessed by seeing how well an LLM's parametric knowledge lines up with reality. So we have the Halu eval QA data set. This asks an LLM to check whether a fact asserted about a topic is a hallucination or not. And in this talk, we're going to be diving into one of my favorite data sets. I love measurement. I used to be a psychologist. Basically, this checks how well an LLM has learned widely circulated misconceptions uh, and conspiracy theories. So let's dive into the truthful QA in a bit more detail. It's a scale with 817 questions across 38 different categories of potential falsehoods. So examples of these include health and legal falsehoods, conspiracies, and fiction. So let's have a look at some example questions. For health, we have the myth that coughing can stop a heart attack. And for legal, we have a question getting at the false belief that you're not allowed to marry your first cousin in California. Turns out that's actually legal. For conspiracies, we have a question about what happens if you wear a tinfoil hat. And then for fiction, we have what happens if you meet a vampire in real life. What should you do? So there are three variations of the truthful QA data set. Two of these are multiple choice. So we can see here an example of that. An LLM is asked to pick from this list of possible answers which is the most likely to be correct. So you can see that if the LLM picked, if you wear a tinfoil hat, you can block mind control signals. This would indicate it had internalized some sort of conspiracy theory. And if it picks, nothing in particular happens. It has not internalized that. So let's now jump over to PyCharm to see how we can use Truthful QA in order to, there we go, there's my mouse, measure the hallucination rate of a model. Okay, so we're going to be using two data sets. 
We're going to be using the data sets package from Hugging Face in order to work with the Truthful QA data set. And we're going to be working uh, with the Langchain package in order to work with LLMs. So first things first, we're going to read in the data set using the data sets package. We read in the Truthful QA data set from Hugging Face. And in this case, we're using the multiple choice version. We get back this data set dictionary object. This gives us the questions but it also gives us these two target fields. So the difference between these is that both of them provide a list of possible answers for each of the questions, but in MC1, only one of them is correct, and in MC2, multiple of them are correct. I'm gonna be working with MC1 because it's a bit easier to work with from a programming perspective, but of course, you can use either. Having a look at one of the questions, our old favorite, what happens if you wear a hat made out of tin foil? You can see here, here are the possible answers. And at the top here, we have that correct answer. Now, let's talk about loading in the model. This is the uh, syntax for connecting with an OpenAI model that I'm going to be using. There are a bunch of different models you can use, including open source models with Langchain. I'm using GPT 3.5 Turbo. And once we've connected to that API, we can pass in a prompt, translate from English to Spanish, I'm happy and we get the correct answer, estoy feliz. Now, we need to combine the two. So anyone who's worked with an LLM would know that one of the trickiest things is phrasing the prompt correctly, and it's no exception in our case. We need something very specific. We need it to consider a question, to consider a list of possible answers, select the correct answer, and select only one answer, oops, sorry, and select that answer and return it without any elaboration. So that's what we've done in this instruction set. What we've then done is passed in one question at a time and the list of possible answers. And then we then pass that over to GPT 3.5. And what we get in return for question four, our one about the tinfoil hat, is exactly what we asked for. One answer without elaboration, and it's even given us the correct answer. Now, we need to do this for every question. Being a data scientist, I'm gonna use a for loop. We're gonna loop over every single one of those questions, the 817 items. And for each, we're going to ask for the output to be returned. And we're also going to do two checks. Is the output one of the valid answers in our list of possible answers? And if so, is it correct? So now we get to the fun part. We can see how many questions it got correct. And in this case, GPT 3.5 got 36% wrong. <laughs> so this is a relatively high hallucination rate, but we're gonna have a chat about that in context now, if I can find my mouse. There we are. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so now that I've shown you how to measure the hallucination rates of an LLM, I'm actually gonna tell you, you don't need to do this yourself. So you're probably thinking, great, why have I just spent 20 minutes sitting through this lecture? Well, the thing is, is measurement of hallucinations, measurement of anything with LLMs in particular, measurement of anything is tricky. And as you saw with our little run through with Truthful QA, it is measuring a very specific thing. It is measuring the rate of hallucinations in, oh, the rate of hallucinations as measured by widely uh, circulated misconceptions or conspiracy theories in the English language. So have a think about that. And have a think about the fact that this is not really giving you the hallucination rate. It's giving you something very specific within hallucination rates. So having a careful think about how you're measuring how good your model is based on things like performance or hallucination measures will help you make trade-offs when you think about what you really need your LLM to do well. So let's end by having a look at what we can do to mitigate hallucinations in LLMs. As we saw, even fairly state-of-the-art models like GPT 3.5 are still hallucinating around one time in three, according to this specific measure. Now, this is, of course, because the data that it was trained on is full of misinformation and conspiracy theories, and the model just learned it during training. The problem is, is training a 355 billion parameter model is really expensive. So we can't really easily just go back to the drawing board and throw it all away. And the thing is, even if we could do that, putting together a data set that is free 
of misinformation, conspiracy theories, all of this bad stuff, it's not actually that simple, as again we saw. So instead, what we can do is work with the models we have now. And there are a number of initiatives to try and reduce the hallucination rate in these models. So the first is crafting prompts that make these models less likely to hallucinate. So the general idea is LLMs are general purpose natural language processing models. And the way you can get them to do the specific task you want them to do is by including as much relevant information, examples, things like this in the prompt as possible. We got a little taste of that during the demo. The second is fine tuning. This is where you create a data set specific to your problem domain and it's pairs of high quality prompts with high quality outputs. And what this means is the model will learn to give responses that are more in line with the type of outputs you want it to, and it will learn information at the same time about your problem domain. The third is self-refinement and collaborative refinement of outputs. This involves a variety of methods which either get the LLM itself to evaluate its answers or use multiple methods or multiple models to compare outputs between them. And then finally, there's one of the most talked about methods at the moment, retrieval augmented generation. This is where additional context, which is relevant to the input prompt, is incorporated into the prompt. It's retrieved from some outside source and it's passed in along with your original prompt to get a more accurate answer from the model. And then of course, you can combine any or all of these techniques in order to reduce a model's hallucination rate. Now, I'm actually running a bit low on time. So I have a little section on RAG that I was going to show. I think given time, I might skip it and jump straight to the end. If you want to know more about the complexities of using RAG in order to reduce hallucination rates, I'm very happy to answer any questions. I can run you through those slides in a little private session. But, God, that sounded so bad. We can go through it. <laughs> we can go through it one-on-one. -on -one. But for the meantime, what I'm going to do is just jump to the end and share my socials. Okay, so while I had to cut the, shot, uh, the talk a little short, what I hope I've done is planted the seed here of how complex it is to work with large language models with this extra ability you know, that we haven't seen before with machine learning models to produce misinformation. What I, I hope I've also gotten you to do is plant the seed to go away and really critically evaluate when someone says that a model performs well or has a low hallucination rate. So this QR code here will take you to all of the sources that I use for this talk. It will take you also to a PDF of the slides. For every single slide, I've linked where the source came from. I really recommend that Washington uh, Post paper. It was very good. And then, of course, here are my socials if you want to keep in touch. I'm going to be around for the next two and one and a half days. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much for that talk. I do wonder what my own hallucination rate is. I don't know. <laughs> I have a little thank you for you. Thank you so much. We do much. actually have a few minutes for a few questions. I don't know if there are any questions. So then you can please step up to the microphone. Maybe I'll get to show my rag slide. Be so mm, maybe. Yes, I do see someone approaching the microphone. So hey, Andy. go right ahead. Sometimes I use large language models to create fiction. Yes. Can I get a high hallucinate hallucination rate, because it's all made up anyway. That's a good question. Oh, I think, oh, yeah, this is on. <laughs> so, this is a great question. I think we can really classify hallucination as something that is actual misinformation, right? So, if something is fiction already, I don't think there's really a reliable way to measure that, because what is your expected outcome, no? I would say probably the thing you're looking for, and this has really been a problem and is getting better as the context window of these models get larger, is internal consistency. So the problem is, is every time you restart a chat with an LLM, it loses its memory. Because as you chat with a model in a back and forth fashion, all of the previous things that you have, you have input to the model and its output are bundled up into the context. But say you're trying to write a whole book, you're probably gonna to have to do several chats, right? So then the problem is, is suddenly your protagonist has, I don't know, 
lives on a different planet and has no memory of all the people that it knew. That would be not quite a hallucination, but at least an internal inconsistency. Yeah. I've solved that. I put my book notes in as rag. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you're, you're, you're kind of getting close to my rag slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Another question over there. Thanks a lot, Jody, for the, for the excellent talk. Um, Oh, you cannot hear me yeah. because I'm Sorry. tiny. <laughs> no worries, you're all good. Um, again, thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. Uh, Could you I, uh, speak towards the microphone, please, so yes. the people at home? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, truthful QA probably is leaked on the ChatGPT and all the rest of the training data. So what are your thoughts on eval leakage? Evaluating the training data directly. So the problem is like, Truthful QA probably has been trained with, um, which means uh, those, those rates are no longer valid because we have seen it during the training. I see, I see. So the question is, part of the problem of evaluation of LLMs is that LLMs start hoovering up the evaluation data sets. This remains a problem. I don't know about with hallucinations, but there is a data set for evaluating AGI called ARC, the Abstraction and Reasoning Corpus. Um, Francois Cholet uh, is an AI researcher at Google. He created that. The way he's dealt with this is the way that psychologists have been dealing with this for ages. You keep the test set under lock and key. It's not publicly available. And this is really going to be the only way we can have unbiased measures, because otherwise it's just test on train, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Great question. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if you have found any relationship in between uh, the capacity of models and how they perform when they are evaluated against truthful QA datasets. For example, my motivation comes from small language models like Fee from mm -hmm. Microsoft, and they also are known for being trained on really good quality textbook quality datasets, right? And yeah. also models from Mistral, for example, Mistral and things like that. And they are also like not as gigantic as GPT 3.5, for example. Yeah. So have you found anything, like any, any relationship in between models that are known for not memorizing that much and also the kind of correlation that exists at the intersection of memorization, data quality, and truthful QA? This is also a very nice question. I haven't looked at this systematically, but I skipped back to a previous slide. So there are a number of hallucination leaderboards, as I said. Um, this is something you could have a look through for yourself and check that rather than having to do it systematically. But like, this is an open secret, right? Like, um, the higher the quality you feed into any model, the better the performance. And with factuality hallucinations in particular, they're going to be lower if you only really expose it to correct information. Faithfulness hallucinations, it's a different question. It's more about the performance of the model, but you're absolutely correct. But yeah, I haven't done it myself, but if you're curious, I strongly encourage you to check out the hallucination leaderboards. Uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because... I, these sorry are, to interrupt uh, you, but no we are, we are we running out of time. Offline. Yeah, of course. Take this offline, there are probably. still a few more questions, but unfortunately, I have to cut it short here, but I'm sure that Jody is more than willing to discuss oh, yeah. it with you Thank after you. the talk in the hallway. Thank you. Uh, we will be back in about five minutes uh, for the next talk. See you there. Thank you.